You're listening to the Ballet Piano Podcast, lifting the lid on dance accompaniment. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Ballet Piano Podcast and to this episode featuring one of my favourite bar and centre exercises. But first, I'm here with the whole of the podcast team, Chris Hobson. Hello, Matt. Akiko Hobson. Hello. And hashtag David Yao of Instagram. Hello, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode focuses on the adage and Ronde de Chambre and Lair at the bar. If we take the adage first, now musically we say it's adagio, which is Italian for slowly, just in case you aren't familiar. But in dance terminology, we call the exercise or the sequence the adage. Is that right, David? It is, because it's slow. What you're trying to do is build up big, big... Um, positions and the movements to have how you get into those big positions slowly and the slower you do it the more you have to uh, be proficient about the way that you get from the start position through the center to the end position and what you're trying to do is develop strength and control and this 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 point of the bar it's extreme facility this is, is. this is the point where the dancers are at you know, they're most warm they're extreme sort of flexibility yes. in this in the slow style that's right um, and and so you can, what tends to happen is the exercise gets quite long. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to also train stamina, yeah, just to keep going and going and going, um, and teaching them that they have to, uh, that the dancers have to learn how to breathe, just like you do when you when you're playing piano, you have to know when to actually phrase something um, to a certain number of bars or counts of things. Mm. So um, that's what we tend to do. Everything is very steady and slow, um, and kind of. Um, Included in adage movements could be rond de jambe en l'air. Yeah. Rond de jambe en l'air, rounding of the leg, remember, rond de jambe. En l'air means in the air. So this action would be like you stick your, your, like stick your leg out. You back on your leg. <laughs> stick it out. Yeah, stick it out. Stick it out. <laughs> and you are going to you hold on to the thigh muscles, but only from, from the knee downwards, you're going to move the lower leg. Um, so you're going to bring from a full extended uh, leg to the side, you're going to bring your toes to touch almost your supporting uh, leg around about your just underneath your, your knee and then go straight back out again. But um, instead of just going in and out in a straight line, you're going to make a shape. Now, there are different shapes. There are two different ways you can do this. You can make a capital D in the air. So you can go um, straight into your into your knee and then slightly forward and around in a half circle in front of your of your supporting leg to the side, uh, that would be a rond de jambe or, um, on l'air, on de or, going outwards. Um, or you can make the same movement in an elliptical, like an egg shape. So there are two ways to do this, and it's mm -hmm. all about holding on. How, how do you hold on to your turnout uh, to just move the lower leg? That's the whole point of this exercise, is to try and hold the thigh and move the lower leg um, in a different way, like um, a different kind of like a, a dynamic, shall we say. Yeah. And would you would you separate the exercises, adage uh, and rond de chambre en l'air? You can, but if you're if you're time um, constrained, what mm. tends to happen is with all the bar exercises, you tend to just like pair things up that kind yeah. of go together or they sure. contrast. Yeah, um, rond de chambre en l'air and adage could go together because when you initially um, start anything, as we said before, you're going to start slowly. So that kind of like flows with the adage movements. Yeah. And the more proficient you get, the faster you get for those movements. So if we start a rond de chambre en l'air move, movement slowly, let's say we choose a three, four. Yeah. Let's we have four bars in five and uh, six, seven and uh, eight. And on the first and beat, and uh, an acrusis, you'd back on your leg out to the side of your body. Mm -hmm. And then you'd almost like feel as though you're swinging your leg towards a supporting leg and then resisting as if you're, if you're pushing through water, as if you're swimming, and uh, one, and uh, hold the extension. And you could do that again, three and a four, three times, five and a six, and close in fifth, and back on your leg out, and uh, eight. And that would be half the exercise of rond de jambe. Now, you could do that separately, or you could mix that thereafter on that same tempo and that same kind of feeling with some développé. Développé means to unfold. Yeah. So you might start from a closed fifth position and you might draw a line up your up, up your supporting leg with your gesture big toe and extend either front side or back. Um, and that might take four four counts to get 
to the extension and back again. So you do, you go up to your ankle and then your knee, and then you extend your leg as if it's almost to the stri- uh, like a, like um, a, a, an unfolding flower or something. Yeah, and you extend fully as if the petals are opening on the flower. Mm-hmm. So you might do coup de pied and retire and attitude and extend to the front and tendu to the floor and close in fifth and uh, fourth. So that's how long it would take musically. Yeah. And so for the adage exercise, is is it primarily about finding the maximum extension? Yes. You're, you're, and that doesn't just mean the height. It also means just your extension what you can hold, um, maintaining the classical form. And yeah. that's very difficult, especially when you're growing. Yeah. Because you need to find out where all those muscles are and how to control those muscles. Yeah. Um, and what, what steps would you include in the adage at the bar? So we obviously you just said développé. Yes, you might do rond de chambre, as we said. Rond de chambre en l'air. What we call do a slow lifting of the leg, relevé long. Yeah. So you might do like a, extend your leg as if you're going to do a tondu, but then you might extend it so, so far and stretch it so far that the actual toes come off the floor and you keep going until you may get up to, a, let's say, hip height or above hip height. Yeah, and grand rond de jambe. Grand rond de jambe. Grand rond de jambe. So that's a big rounding of the leg. So yeah. at 90 degrees, you might extend your leg and lift your leg up to 90 degrees and then move it from that uh, that um, position, let's say, to the front, all the way to the side and all the way to the back. That would be a grand rond de jambe on day or outwards away from the center. And so, what are our thoughts on music for the adage and Ronde de Chambre en l'air? Before that, why is it your favorite exercise, Matt? Because it's a, it's a chance to <laughs> indulge, same as plies is. It's, I know, that, you know, the dancers are working really hard to get their legs, you know, to maximum extension and just know that I'm sort of maybe possibly helping them do that gives me great satisfaction. Anyone else? Indulgence. Indulgence. It's always <laughs> about indulgence. You said a couple of weeks ago you enjoy playing class and being the unsung hero in the corner that's supporting everything. Yeah. But at the same time, we can be quite selfish, can't we? Because it's what we love to do and we're doing it and we're getting a big thrill out of doing this as well and getting such enjoyment out of supporting. I do enjoy my job a lot. I love my job. Mm. I especially love Adage. <laughs> I'm with yeah. you. Whether it's at the bar or in the centre. And the music we play in Adage is just very nice, isn't it? In- indulgent. Yeah. It's yeah. Like more than just being indulgent for us, it's very inspirational as a dancer because it's a really difficult exercise to do. You're really holding the full length of your leg in the air and that's really quite difficult to do. But to have this beautiful music just rolling around o- over the top is, is just really helpful. It's a different sort of indulgence than what we've talked about in plies where you mentioned it briefly or in tondis because now you're starting to get artistry, aren't we? Yeah. In the choreographed into the exercise yeah. as well. And I think that makes the difference yeah. for me when you can see yeah. performances starting to come into the class now like say to just technique. you know that big anacrusis before a ponche let's say that yeah. big upward stretch back and leg and then into that tip of the ponche one of the best there's something so lovely I, about that it's, it's a similar thing in the build-up um adagio spartacus oh, uh, it's they, they go, you know just two bars in four dancers counts in five and six and seven and uh, eight and and the um, ascending scale and then just big pull out at the end of the introduction which you wouldn't do normally but because it's so famous that you know you hit that top a flat and if it's choreographed well with it or you've been doing it for an assessment or something yeah it's it's, it's special it's magical <laughs> i know when i played it for auditions um at a place that i've worked at previously you look the panel look over at you and smile yes. and it's, mm. it never fails it to never gets get boring. some no. emotion out of that it's a chance to throw in all your semi quavers as well isn't yeah. it and just <laughs> fill up that keyboard and really use every note possible and every dynamic possible. Yeah. Yeah. And the range of repertoires, I know, we, again, we've briefly spoken about this, but almost anything can go, can't it? You know, from, you can be incredibly traditional and stick with Minkus and things like that, or you could pan forward and play Adele and pretty yeah. much everything yeah. in between. Yeah. As long as it's of the right sort of flavor will work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to match the melody, like matching with the movement, what, what they are doing. Yeah. Whatever the accent and also movement of the note is matched with the movement of the leg. And they, that tend to be good for them, you know, to help them move. I don't know. I, I pick up some of the choreography, but I think... 
no, I'm sorry, um, pick up some of the choreography, but also I'm going for the intention behind everything. So I don't think it always has to match because there's not a lot of accents in the adage, is it? No. It's, I mean, it's not wishy washing through, it is but set, the, but in between, yeah, that's it's important. The, it's the in between things, yeah, yeah. With, the, with the melodies over the top. What do you like to play, Kiko? You still haven't answered the question. You brushed it off onto somebody else. Come on, give us, give us your secrets, woman. I like. Um, Tell us why you're good at what you do. I'm not very good. Yes, but you are. Yes, you are. I like uh, playing uh, Morricone music. Yes. Uh, it's it's always inspiring, and every, it's a film, the film that you know everybody loves. Yeah. And, and I think I love. I enjoy it, and I th hope. I think. Uh, dancers that also yeah. enjoy. I mean, I think it should look expensive and it should sound expensive, the adage. You know, because going from fifth position in that developer, you want that foot to really sort of lick up <laughs> the leg <laughs> before it unfolds. Yes. And it's, it's the, you know, the precision of all those positions and then yeah. passing through fifth and then other developers and yeah. the extensions. It, you know, it, it's got to be one continuous movement. Yeah. But... It is the emotional and, content that mm. makes the difference. Mm. It really does between just a plain old tune and something that's really going to inspire you and carry you. Yeah, and that's why I always fill it out because hopefully that sounds more expensive yeah, and that's... luxurious. It's like you said previously, Matt, about turning on a dime. I think it was in the Tondu episode when we talked about and changing up the styles. Now, we'll keep, I'll quite often keep the same, obviously we'll keep the same pulse and the same style, but jump decades across from repertoire or yeah. centuries across from repertoire yeah, yeah, yeah. So start with something you know maybe mozart to start off with and mm. then end up you know playing stereophonics for the second side mm. and just yeah. going from one to another and watching the different reactions is mm. it's exciting it's great because once when you change the whole flavor of the actual exercise changes with that and that's what you know, really important for the for the dancer to understand and get used to mm. and the range of dynamics that we use as well when we play for adage is our adagio is much greater than any exercise that we've had so far isn't it? because you know it's not just quiet and it's not just loud it's yeah it's from you know pianissimo to fortissimo and every single increment in between absolutely the fuller it is the better because that's exactly what the movements are like the biggest the fullest movement that you yeah. can do i always play the uh, the tchaikovsky piano concerto number one because oh. it's got it's got yeah. e it's got each beat in the bar as well yeah so even though it's adagio it's got that little bit of structure yeah and then if i choose to sort of take out each beat and then sort of make it more legato i can i do things mm. like that mm. but then you know that it's always there as well where do we stand on four fours and three fours around the table oh yeah i forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> i like the structure of the four four but i love the fullness of the three right i mean i enjoy playing it in, in in both time yeah. signatures yeah I used to really, I used to really enjoy threes and dislike fours. And the last few years I've changed my mind. I, mm. I like them both equally now, different reasons, but maybe mm, that's because yeah. I've specifically gone out and tried to learn and change my repertoire so that I've got a bigger variety of four fours because it's standard is going to be on a three usually, isn't it? Mm. I think most, most people most, set and dodge on a three. three yeah. Yeah. But, and also in the, in this slower tempo as well, it's very easy to play something that is in three, put it into four. Yeah. And vice versa, yeah. which is something I do all the time. Yeah. I can just, you know, play any tune in either two, three or four f in this slow. Yeah. You know, adagio. Yeah, I can play Jurassic Park in three and four. <laughs> yeah, but you can, yeah, but you can also play it for a Polonaise as well, can't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember once I threw you under the bus to play? Was it a reverence on a polonaise a few years ago because I was going for a haircut? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back and you played Jurassic Park. <laughs> you were so mad at me. Yes, I was, I was really mad. <laughs> uh, and what about, what about the music for Ronda Jean Monlaire? Let's say it's a separate exercise. You could, you'd probably ask for a waltz, wouldn't you? Yeah, there's, a, there's a different kind of a feeling. There's a lightness that you need. Yeah. Um, so that it doesn't become really heavy because it's a quite a difficult movement to do repetitively yeah. um, on the thighs. So the, the lighter the, the, the tune or the, or the feeling feels, the easier it is to do. Yeah. Because you said when you were setting it, you do and a one. Yes. And the extension bit is the one. Yeah. Now, if I'm playing a Ronde Jean at the bar, I'll take out the two, three mm. Mm. and sort of leave it hanging. Mm. You know, because I know they're really finding that extension yeah. to second. Yeah. And then on the rond de jambe, you know, the actual circling of, of the uh, the toe at the knee, 
that's when I put the music back in and as they're extending sort of to help them yeah because yeah. just the on low is going to be lighter isn't it it is Definitely. and and yeah I mean the one that springs to mind I can't actually remember what it's called now so I'll gloss over it but the theme tune from up I know we've been quite theme tune heavy recently <laughs> so let's go with that. but it's light and then what I've realized Mark, I do exactly what you said I, in the left hand I don't go um cha cha um cha I go dum cha dum cha yeah and then the melody will do fill in the third beat so it's automatically lighter and just because it's a little bit quicker as well yes. it gives it that lighter yeah. feel but even on a four foot you'd, you'd still need that lightness mm. in whatever you're going to play just to help the dancer to get through it mm. because they've got their leg ultimately in in passe position mm. so their thigh's already heavy yeah and then the lower leg is yeah. is, is working really hard yeah. so yeah it can't be too heavy can it yeah. i'm just thinking matt what do you like to play for adage just nipping back because um, we never asked you we asked why you love it but we never asked <laughs> what you like <laughs> i'll i'll play anything yeah. from um yeah i'll, I'll play misty um, I love music. Or any any jazz standard, any musical theatre, anything um, Phantom of the Opera or Sunset Boulevard, any of those poppy MT stuff. It's they work great. It's like the repertoire that's personal to you, isn't it? And the repertoire that's emotive for you that we play. Mm. Somebody once told me that if you're playing stuff, you've got to you've got to get your own bible of ballet music because if you just nick somebody else's, you're faking it through. You can take inspiration from other people, but you're never going to be 100 percent in the room if you're trying to play like somebody else. Yeah, yes. you can use use other people as inspiration, use their repertoire as inspiration, but you've got to play it as Chris Hobson accompanying this ballet class, you can't play it as Matt Gregory or Akiko no. because you, you because need to be could, true to we you. We could potentially play the same tune, but it's how you play it yeah. for yeah. each exercise. And we, we do, you know, cross over in our tunes, don't we? The mm. three of us. We've learned that so far a lot. <laughs> 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 in this podcast series, how much we, how much we play. <laughs> but, but do you uh, get territorial about some tunes? That, you know, that's my tune. <laughs> I have few tunes that, Chris, you play, and I know it's your specialty, so I don't touch. Mm. Although I know that I can play, I mean, you can't really because if, if no. it's music that's existing, you can put it in your repertoire. Yeah, you and, still, and what can yeah. anyone yeah. else do about it? Maybe it's different for Akiko and I because we work in the same building. So, in respect of you, we're slightly. I'm slightly conscious to not play stuff that Akiko plays, uh, but mm. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> but if I'm in a, if I'm working somewhere else in a different school or a different company, right. or yeah. I'm recording a CD or I'm doing something else, then all that respect goes out the window because we're not <laughs> because we're not in the same building. Together so it doesn't matter the dancers don't know how our repertoire crosses over or yeah. how our life crosses yeah. over yeah i i think that as well i think well i've I played this class this morning at a school or a company and i think mm. i'm going on to do something else and these dancers in the afternoon haven't heard what i've done this morning yeah <laughs> so i can repeat myself recycling yes. yeah yeah of my playlist for that day as it were <laughs> when i but was I covering always... you a lot i did that a lot <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i was doing you know 45 hours sometimes more know. classes a week which was which started, but i didn't have to think of 45 different no, no. <laughs> and i always use um you know the world ballet days yeah. Mm. yeah i always use that and watch the ballet class from a musician's point of view That's and obviously idea. listen to mm. the music yeah. to gain inspiration yeah, yeah. Of what of what those sort of raw ballet pianists do, or you know the companies around the world, what they play yeah. for each exercise. Yeah, and I, you know, I learn from from those people as well. Mm. But when you're starting out, I mean, that's a good like to just top up what you're doing. But when you're starting out, what are your thoughts on, let's say, of of um, playing set music for exams and things like that, learning the, the trade through that way? Well, I started actually working for local RAD. Mm. syllabus class and mm. I did it for a couple of years so I I actually memorized all grade one to eight um, wow. tune wow. and it actually did help me understanding what the steps are yes. and what sort of music are required for each mm. like you know whole ballet class mm. uh, so it was helpful as a beginning as a ballet pianist and mm. then you know you have to develop your own at mm. some point anyway so I think as a as a as a novice pianist, I would say go on to YouTube, watch these World Ballet Day classes that are out there, or you know a full ballet class from any company doesn't matter, and you can go on iTunes or Spotify and look at what people have recorded for ballet classes, you know, such as Modern Ballet Studio Melodies by Christopher Hobson. <laughs> <laughs> plug, 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 plug. <laughs> or, you know, but to gain ideas off other people, like Akiko said for the Ronde Jean episode, you know, everybody was playing Moon River, so I knew I had to find something that was mm. like Moon mm. River. 
Yeah. And you might have started off playing Moon River, but then you quickly go, everybody's playing this, so I want to do something else. And there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with going and listening to what other people are doing. Yeah. Especially if you're if you're new and you you won't know what a step looks like. You you know, you yeah. start to become familiar with the names, but you don't know what the choreography of a step is. So mm -hmm. to me, for Donkey Shears, Ron de Jean signified a slow waltz on a three four until I learned properly what it mm. was. And then so I knew it was you know like the Moon Rivers or the Gymnopodies. Yeah. And that's a good way, I think, to build your repertoire is mm. and it, it's not stealing from others. It's good. It, that is definitely learning from others. And because there's very few courses out there that teach you what to do and how to do it. Mm. I think that's a good way. And then it comes back to what we said earlier about you've got to play a ballet class in your own way. Yeah. You, I I can't play a ballet class like a Kiko or Matt do because it's it's personal. It's like teaching, isn't it? Everything that you do is so unique to you. Mm -hmm. It's like you're putting your you you're playing a ballet class with your heart on your sleeve because Absolutely. it's it's the most honest, really. If you if you if you're fully into the class and you're just doing what you enjoy doing, it's the most honest you can be without opening your mouth. You're just mm. communicating your honesty with your fingers, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. And going back to uh going back to the playing the syllabus stuff, that is very useful for how music is structured for a yeah. ballet class exercise mm, definitely. and introductions. Yes. Mm. Learning different intros. Yeah. Because yeah. they're all in, you know, four counts or two counts, mm. but it's, it's really useful for, for learning introductions. Yeah. yeah. And um, there's such a, a difference between like playing for an examination and then you're playing for an open class or, or, you know, a, a professional company. There's a complete difference when, mm. you know, when yeah. you hear that the, the yes. kind of music that you, you choose to play. Mm. Yeah. Jonathan still once produced a book, didn't he? I think it was when he was at, still at the RAD. Was it called a dance class anthology? It was, it was about a hundred page book, maximum 90 pages. And it talks you through a ballet class. Wow. Um, I think the last time I spoke with Jonathan, it was definitely out of print, but I know there were copies pinging about on YouTube and things like that. Or maybe the RAD library's got a copy that you, they may be able to send you electronically for a small fee. Mm. I'm not sure, but that, that helped me out a lot when I started because it talked through each exercise and the different examples from classical rep, from musical theatre, from ballet yeah. rep. Mm. And that was a good place to start. I mean, me. I was talking to Jonathan still just this morning. Um, and he will be on the podcast, uh, yeah, listeners. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. will be on. Because he I can't wait for Jonathan to come <laughs> on. I know. I mean, we think our knowledge is I know, all right. Oh. He is. We he's a this god. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we call him the Godfather of <laughs> Godfather. <laughs> yes. He really is. But he said something to me so useful this morning because he coaches at the Opera House, and he says being thrown into a ballet class and feeling that adrenaline of whether something's working or not mm. is worth 10 coaching sessions. Oh, and it really yeah, is. True. You can learn your repertoire in isolation. I, you know, um, you need to be in this situation yeah. to be nervous to, to, for to one and a half. To yeah. The nerves, you know, we've all experienced them. There's nothing like it knowing whether something's going to work or not. Yeah. I remember when I started, uh, I played for one class, you know, one hour and a half or so. After one class, I was so tired. I was so hungry and I just wanted to have a nap. Yeah. <laughs> I still get nervous now if I'm going to a new company where I know I don't know the ballet master and I might not know any of the dancers. I, I still get nervous nearly two decades in. I don't think it's ever going to leave. Well, I played for uh, a certain hashtag David Yao of Instagram <laughs> <laughs> just two days ago. That was bliss. And, um, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I felt very nervous. Oh, it was gorgeous. David in teacher mode is something <laughs> else. David yes. is so scary when he's teaching. I mean, he's wonderful as a person, but he's wonderful as a teacher. Well, I'm not sure like, if I can copy David teaching me as a teacher. <laughs> I get really scared. I have a high aspirations of, you know, for my students. So, you know, Aim high. high. It was wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. It was wonderful. What did you come up with, Matt? What's it? Um, wow by name. No, Yao by name. Wow by nature. He's Yao by name and Wow by nature. <laughs> oh no, I'm blushing now. What did you say? He's the nicest person in the Western world. Yes, <laughs> that also oh, is true. <laughs> well, that's it, podcasters, for another episode. We hope you found this useful and insightful. In the next episode, we get to the final bar exercise of Grand Batman. Yay! So please look out for that next week. Can we bring fireworks to celebrate <laughs> the end of bar? <laughs> if you want, bring a sparkler. Yay. Okay. Yay. Um, please also follow us on Instagram using the handle at Ballet Piano Podcast and like us on Facebook. So until next time, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.